and welcome to the Penguin Prof channel. Today I want to talk about heredity and sex and Mendel, peas, cats, and so much more. Probably everybody has looked at their family members and actually asked a lot of questions, but wondered why it is that we look like our parents, but not exactly, and where all of these family resemblances come from and how they get passed down. Um, we refer to that as, as heredity, and the, the scientific study of heredity is called genetics. And uh, questions about this date way, way back. I'm just going to mention a couple of the big thinkers on this topic. Hippocrates, of course, he was a big thinker about a lot of topics. He came to believe that particles came from all parts of the body, and they were incorporated into the eggs and sperm. He called these particles pangenes. Um, Aristotle was really not much in favor of pangenes. He really thought it was all in the blood. He believed that semen actually was a purified form of blood, and he believed that semen uh, would mix with the mother's menstrual blood in the uterus and that that would give rise to the offspring and all of its traits. Now, you might think that's a really strange thing to think about. He's very blood-centered, but actually his beliefs persevere in a way, and we use the term bloodlines. Um, we use them especially when we're talking about uh, thoroughbreds and breeding dogs and horses and things like that, but I just I think that's kind of cool. Um, in the 19th century, it became uh, popular to believe that we were a blended mixture of our parents. Um, you can see where that would have some appeal. I mean, you kind of do look like a blended version of your relatives, but it turns out that that really doesn't make any sense because, I mean, if you have ever blended paint, you know that once you blend two colors together, you, you can't get those original colors back out. And that's certainly not the same with uh, inherited traits. In 1866, uh, a monk by the name of Gregor Mendel from Austria had been playing with peas in the Abbey Garden, and he was a really important person in the history of genetics, as I'm sure you know, um, because he actually applied mathematical principles to uh, gardening, something that really had not been done before. He was very observant, and he took really good notes. And he argued, correctly as it turns out, that parents pass on discrete, what he called, heritable factors. Um, in other words, they, these things are not blended um, from the parents into the offspring, but they retain their individuality generation after generation. These heritable factors later became known as, interestingly enough, back to uh, Hippocrates, pangenes in 1889 by a botanist, a Dutch botanist actually, Hugo de Vrij. Um, the term pangenes was later shortened uh, to genes, which of course is the term that we use today. Mendel defined a character as a heritable feature that varies among individuals. And in, in pea plant terms, he actually studied seven uh, different characters, things like flower color, plant height, the, the skin of the seeds, whether the flower position was axial or terminal. The trait is a variant for a character. So for example, if you're looking at flower color, your trait could be either a purple trait or a white trait. If you're looking at the character of plant height, the trait could be tall or short. He also defined true breeding varieties. Now this is why working with plants is so great because plants, you can either control the breeding yourself by taking pollen uh, with a paintbrush, or you can actually allow many plants to self-fertilize. And if you do that, true breeding varieties will always produce offspring which are identical to the parent. Um, if you take two different varieties and you cross-fertilize them, we call that a hybrid. Finally, true breeding parents, we're going to call the P generation, P is for parental, the hybrid offspring are called the F1s. This is the first filial generation. Uh, this comes from the Latin, which uh, filius, which means son. If you cross the F1s, you get F2s, and then you could cross those and get F3s, and so forth. So what Mendel did was he was able to manipulate and control the breeding of these pea plants. It's actually pretty simple to do, and he could use a paintbrush to do the crosses that he wanted, or he could simply cover 
uh, since these are perfect flowers, they have both male and female parts, he could actually prevent cross-fertilization. If you cover these um, with material he actually used as like a little bag, basically, they will still fertilize. And so they're really, really handy to, uh, to use for genetic experiments. After fertilization, the peas mature, and then you can plant them, and then you can look and see what you get. Mendel came up with four hypotheses, and I'm going to describe them using modern terminology. This, by the way, is the abbey where uh, his work was done. Um, the first hypothesis states that alleles are alternative forms of a gene. So an allele could be, for example, in, in the plant height character, we can have an allele for tall plants, and we can have an allele for short plants. So we can use capital T and lowercase t. Uh, respectively, to symbolize that. Now, for each characteristic, you're going to inherit one allele or one different form of the gene from each parent. So you're going to get two alleles for any given gene, and those alleles may be the same. They may say the same thing. They may be two big T's or two little T's, or they could be different. We call that heterozygous, one of each, and those terms will be very important to us as we go along. The third hypothesis says that if the alleles are different, so you're talking about now only heterozygous individuals, one is visible and the other is not. So we refer to the, the expressed trait as being dominant and the unexpressed, it's still there, but it's hidden, we call that recessive. So these are the characters that Mendel looked at with his pea plants. And what you notice is that for each, there are two traits. So for example, plant height, they came tall and short. If you have a heterozygous individual that has one allele for tall and one allele for short, what it will actually express is tall, but it will carry the allele for short. And future generations, you'll actually see that short allele come back out again. Finally, uh, the fourth hypothesis, which is so important that we actually refer to it as a law, states that a sperm or egg cell carries only one allele for each inherited character because alleles separate from each other during gamete formation. Now, that's kind of a lot of, of terminology, but this is actually a very simple idea. But did, did you catch what that really means? Um, I want to give a little example here, what I mean by that, uh, using something that most people are just intuitively familiar with, and that is, um, well, we're going to talk about sex, of course. We're actually going to talk about gender determination in humans. So a great example of the law of segregation is the production of eggs and sperm and the determination of gender. Most people know that males have the sex chromosomes X and Y, and females are XX. So when a male produces sperm, 50% of his sperm, approximately, carry the X chromosome, and those would fertilize with the egg to make a girl, and 50% carry the Y chromosome. Now for females, half of the eggs carry one X, and half of the eggs carry the other. Of course, they end up looking the same. But the point is that an XY male only sends forward either the X or the Y to the next generation in his sperm. Females send forward only one of the two X's, not both. Okay, so a cross between two individuals differing in a single character we call a monohybrid cross, which should make sense to you because mono means one. But I don't know about you, I'm a little sick of peas. I'd rather talk about cats because, you know, you got to have cute cats in order to have a popular YouTube video. So here we go. So if you take an individual that is true breeding for brown fur, we're going to call it Big B, Big B, and you cross it with a cat that is true breeding for white fur, we're going to call it Little B, Little B, all of the kittens will have brown fur, and they will be heterozygous. They will have one Big B allele and one Little B allele. And the monohybrid cross describes what you get when you cross two hybrid cats. So two cats, each Big B little b. So the way to do this is with a Punnett square, your friend, the Punnett square. So the Punnett square helps you to keep all of your alleles straight. So for example, in this square, the two big b's, you get one big b from this cat and one big b from this cat. This individual, you get the big b from this guy and the little b from that guy. Hopefully you, you can see how that works. 
And what that looks like in terms of actual color fur, you get one homozygous dominant brown fur cat. You're going to get two heterozygous still brown fur cats. But that white color is going to come out. The white that you didn't see in the F1s, you didn't see it in either of these guys, comes out in the F2s. So you get the white back when you have a homozygous recessive individual. And you get a fairly famous ratio here. The phenotype is the trait as it is expressed that you can see. And that ratio we call three to one in a monohybrid cross. In other words, you have three individuals expressing the dominant phenotype, in this case, brown fur, and one individual expressing the recessive, in this case, the white fur phenotype. The ratio of genotypes is one to two to one. One homozygous dominant, two heterozygous individuals, one homozygous recessive individual. Okay, dihybrid crosses, when you take two varieties and you try and handle them at the same time. So it can get a little messy. Uh, Mendel wanted to know if the inheritance of one trait influenced the inheritance of another. So for example, does being green instead of yellow give rise to more round seeds instead of wrinkled? Are they linked in some way? The answer is no. The gene responsible for seed color is independent to the gene that's responsible for seed shape. So these observations gave rise to Mendel's second law, which is the law of independent assortment. It states that the inheritance of one character has no effect on the inheritance of another. Basically, it says that a dihybrid cross is equivalent to two monohybrid crosses. It's like saying flipping a coin and getting heads does not affect rolling a die and getting the number two. They're, they're totally independent events. So we're going to look at cats again, and we're going to look at two traits now. This little kitty is true breeding for white fur and a short tail. And this kitty is true breeding for brown fur and a long tail. And we're going to cross those together, and you're going to get individuals that are all heterozygous for both traits. So all of these kitties have brown fur and short tails. And in a dihybrid cross, we're going to cross two of these F1s together to get an F2. And because you have two traits that you're worried about, you're going to end up with a fairly exhaustive looking table like this. And my students always ask me, can you do the dihybrid cross for us? And sure, why not? But we'll, we'll speed it up a little bit. Okay, this music is not available for download on iTunes. Uh, what you see in the dihybrid cross is the classic 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 ratio. What you're going to get are nine cats with brown fur and the short tail. The, these are the individuals that uh, inherit both of the dominant traits. You're going to get three cats that have the white fur and the short tail. You're going to get three cats that have brown fur and the long tail. And only one individual is going to have both recessive traits, white fur and long tail. So there you go. So unfortunately, a lot of Mendelian genetics is taught incorrectly by professors, and you still see incorrect stuff in textbooks. Um, we're very beholden to these great Mendelian trait stories because there are so many of them that are really fun, and you can do them in class. Unfortunately, most common visible human traits are not inherited in Mendelian fashion. These are myths. And I have to admit that I was taught that some of these were true, and I myself, when I started teaching, would do some of these in class. Um, they are fun. Unfortunately, none of these are inherited in Mendelian fashion. I know, I know. Uh, the cleft chin, the hair color, the, the toe length, the widow's peak. This refers to the, uh, the hairline. Um, this refers to the expression of pigments uh, when you eat beets. Oh, I should probably explain this one. Um, this has to do with the excretion of a really foul-smelling material by individuals who eat asparagus. Um, none of these are inherited in Mendelian fashion. Usually, 
the, the trait doesn't even fall into two distinct categories, like the hitchhiker's thumb um, is taught as a, a Mendelian trait. But actually, the range of, of the angle of the thumb is, is continuous. Most thumbs are actually somewhere in the middle. Some of these traits aren't even genetic at all, like arm crossing. Um, an extensive study was done in 1932, but no one wants to believe it because it's really fun to do in class. Tongue rolling is one that I believed in. It is a character, not a trait. So in other words, there are many genes that are responsible. The truth is out there. You can get current information about Mendelian inheritance in humans. Um, this is put out by uh, John Hopkins University. If you just Google O-M-I-M, -M, you will get the information there. As always, I hope this information was helpful. Thank you so much for visiting the Penguin Prof channel. Please show the love. Like, share, and subscribe. You can visit on Facebook and follow on Twitter. Good luck.